Hi, welcome back. So today we're going to take a look at chapter 17, which is reproduction in humans. So if you remember from the previous chapter, uh, fertilization takes place when two gametes come together and they form a new cell or a zygote. Now, these two gametes have each come with half the amount of genetic information required to make up one full set of genetic information and they come together and they make one cell. So, in humans, female gametes are called eggs and they are made in the ovaries. Male gametes are called sperm and they are made in the testes. Now, a female's gametes or eggs are formed inside of her ovaries before she's even born. So, a female is born with a set amount of eggs inside of her ovaries these eggs will however only mature when she reaches puberty. The egg gets released from the ovary and this is called ovulation. In males however, uh, sperm production only begins when a male reaches uh, puberty. At this point, cells uh, divide through the process of meiosis which basically halves the genetic information uh, of the cells and starts producing sperm. So, after ovulation, the egg travels to the uterus along the fallopian tube. Along the way, uh, the egg will meet a sperm. These two gametes will fuse and produce a zygote. The new zygote then starts dividing as it travels down to the uterus. This zygote then starts to divide into more cells and once it's divided, I think it's between 16 and 32 cells, it now is not turn the zygote anymore, it becomes an embryo. And it's the embryo that travels further down and implants into the uterus, into the uterine wall, which uh, the uterine wall provides all the essential nutrients and the right environment uh, for this embryo to grow. This is called implantation. After the embryo has implanted, it continues to grow. And along with it, uh, the placenta starts to develop, which is basically a structure which supplies the embryo with nutrients. The, the placenta is highly vascular and it allows the uh, mother's and the fetus blood to come very close together. So for example, if this is the mother's uh, blood supply and this is the fetus's blood supply, uh, there's a very tiny space in between the two uh, vasculature structures and this allows uh, nutrients, oxygen to diffuse from the mother's blood to the embryo's blood and it allows waste materials and carbon dioxide from the embryo to diffuse across to the mother's blood uh, to be excreted. This way the embryo receives all the food and nutrients that it requires to grow. It's also important to note that the mother's blood and the fetus's blood does not actually come into contact with each other. They do not mix. There's no uh, contact, the mother's blood doesn't go into the embryo at all. The embryo has its own blood supply and its own blood. All the nutrients in the mother's blood get to the embryo uh, vasculature system through the process of the fusion. Now there's another structure that protects the fetus and this is called the amnion. And the amnion provides uh, amniotic fluid which surrounds the uh, growing fetus and it's sort of like a shock absorber for the fetus. This fluid supports the uh, embryo and allows it to grow further. So once the embryo has matured completely and the baby is ready, the baby is born. And after it's born, the baby has a very, the baby is still very underdeveloped, I don't want to say underdeveloped, it's not developed completely. So there are certain things that the mother needs to do to look after the baby. One example is the baby needs to keep warm. It can't generate as much heat as we do, for example, efficiently. It needs to be looked after uh, very specifically. And one of the requirements is nutrition. The baby needs very specific uh, nutrient needs. And this is because the baby's um, alimentary canal, its digestive system, has not developed to a point where it can just digest anything. The most suitable thing for any baby to consume is mother's milk and I'll explain why. Well the mother's milk contains immunoglobulins which are basically antibodies which protect the baby against uh, any infections or uh, things that it might get exposed to. So through um, giving the baby mother's milk 
the baby gets a sort of immune uh, defense, protecting it from getting sick. A mother's milk also has the exact precise amount of each nutrient that the baby requires. It's got the right uh, percentage of fat to carbohydrate to protein. It also has the right type of protein, which is a whey protein. Cow's milk is not suitable for babies because the baby can't digest the protein in cow's milk, but it can digest the protein found in mother's milk. Okay, so let's take a look at the hormones that play a role in the menstrual cycle. So, in our brain we've got the pituitary gland and the pituitary gland secretes both luteinizing hormone as well as follicle stimulating hormone. Now follicle stimulating hormone or FSH stimulates the development of the follicles to develop. These follicles then start secreting estrogen which results in an increased estrogen concentration in the blood. This leads to the growth and development of the uterine wall. Now LH on the other hand or luteinizing hormone spikes when the follicle is fully developed. This leads to ovulation and the follicle then becomes the corpus luteum and the corpus luteum secretes progesterone which keeps the uterine lining thick and spongy. So FSH helps with the growth of the uterine wall and progesterone keeps the uterine lining thick and spongy. So if fertilization does not occur, the corpus luteum disappears and progesterone is no longer secreted. This leads to the breakdown of the uterine wall as progesterone maintains the uterine wall and menstruation. If fertilization occurs, the corpus luteum keeps on secreting progesterone and the placenta develops, which further secretes progesterone. Now it's important to note that there are some diseases which can be transmitted sexually. One of these diseases is HIV and HIV is a virus and it's passed uh, from person to person through blood or sexual contact for example. There are other ways of transfer, just go read about them in your textbook. But how HIV uh, attacks your body is it basically infects your lymphocytes and your lymphocytes are a type of white blood cell if you remember from previous work. Now your white blood cells um, are your immune defense mechanism. Your white blood cells protect you so when anything invades your body the white blood cells go and attack that pathogen or bacteria or virus whatever it is and it gets rid of it. This is what makes this virus so deadly is HIV infects these cells that are supposed to protect you and they are called your T cells and what it does it essentially hijacks the T cells um, internal machinery so the little organelles inside the T cells and it gives these organelles instructions to make more um, HIV viruses so it hijacks the cell tells the cell make more of HIV viruses and then these when, once there are so many HIV viruses inside the cell, the T cells burst and this spreads a whole bunch of other HIV virons into the bloodstream and they go and enter new T cells and then they go do the same and the same and eventually your immune system is depleted, there's no cells that are able to protect you from infections and that is why people with uh, HIV develop a syndrome condition called AIDS which is the typical clinical uh, presentation that we think of when we speak about HIV and AIDS. So these people are often emaciated, they are very thin, they have very ill health, they usually have secondary infectious diseases such as TB or pneumonia and they often die of these secondary diseases because their body is not able to award these diseases off. Alright, well that's it for this chapter. Let's take a look at some past papers. Question 29. The diagram shows part of the reproductive system of a human female. In which labeled region would implantation of a zygote normally take place? So the zygote usually implants in the uterus. Question 30. The diagram shows four methods of birth control. Which one is placed inside the uterus? while intrauterine devices are placed inside the uterus. So figure 4.1 shows the diagram of three types of cells found in the female reproductive system. Draw one straight line to join each diagram to the correct type of cell. So here are our different types of cells. 
This is a muscle cell. This is a ciliated cell, easily seen by the cilia. And this is a egg cell. Cell B is found on the inside of the oviducts. Here we've got cell B. This type of cell is also found in the inside of the air passages leading to the lungs. Describe the function of these cells in the air passages leading to the lungs. Well, cilia help to keep the air passages clean. It helps to clean the air. It also helps to move the mucus upwards in the alimentary canal to remove any organisms that got stuck in the mucus. So by beating and moving the mucus in a certain direction, the cilia removes pathogens as well as dust particles. Suggest why these cells are present in the oviducts. Well, they are present to move the egg from the ovaries to the uterus. Figure 4.2 shows the organs of the female reproductive system. Identify the parts labeled D, E and F and choose words from the list. Well, that's easy. Here we've got the ovary, here we've got the oviduct, and here we've got the uterus. On figure 4.3, draw an X to show where sperm is released during sexual intercourse. Sperm is released here. Suggest why the tail is important for reproduction. Well, the tail beats to propel the sperm forward so that it can meet the egg. Alright guys, so I hope you guys enjoyed the lesson. I hope it made some sort of sense. Good luck with the studying and go and get those good marks.